Here we are, Think Green Thursday for Thursday, May 27th, 2021. And today we're going to find all about the troubles with tomatoes with uh, Cooperative Extension Director here in Alamance County, Bill Kleiner, who's also our horticulture agent. And he is going to fill us all in on what's bothering our tomatoes. So go ahead, Bill. Okay, well, let's. Uh... Let's, thanks, Chris. We're gonna start out by looking at uh, some of the troubles with tomatoes. And actually I have about 25 major issues that you'll see the most, probably mm. the top 25. Tomatoes get a probably well over 200 or more different problems, believe it or not. Uh, they get quite a few. And I'm gonna talk about some specific ones that you'll see mostly in this North Carolina area. Because <clears throat> we're gonna be starting to get the old questions, why are my tomatoes dying? As the heat comes in and the dryness comes in, we'll be starting to see all kinds of things. And of course, what are the spots on my tomatoes? And all different types of spots and lesions on leaves and and tomatoes and everything like that. So we'll talk about some of these, but I wanna hit the old pause button like a lot of my, my grandsons say. And just to think about, think about our tomatoes. You know, what does a healthy tomato plant look like? And that's when you're planting tomatoes, you gotta take a look at everything. You know, you want that lush green foliage and going really well throughout the season. You also wanna take a look at what varieties you're growing, you should have a good idea because there's a lot of things that are involved in a variety, such as disease resistance. There's two North Carolina varieties, Mount, Mount Rouge and Mountain Merit, which are uh, disease resistance to certain diseases. And then you have the earlier late varieties, the bush or state varieties, and of course your grape, plum or regular. So you gotta know a little bit about your plants before you get in there. The other thing that's important is, you know, our tomato plants determinate, which is, means the bush type tomatoes or the indeterminate, which are the state or trellis. And this is important, and I'm going to explain the importance of it throughout the talk as we will uh, make some different recommendations on, on what to use and what to do. But your indeterminate uh, on your left here. One of the things that they just continue to grow, okay, throughout the summertime, right up to the frost. And of course, you're determined that they are, what they are, are just the bush tight tomatoes. And they reach a certain height and then they stop growing. So these bush type tomatoes are really good for canning. They uh, ripen around the same time, usually in a one to two week period. When I was working in the, uh, the green ramp tomato industry up in Pennsylvania, northeastern Pennsylvania, they use a lot of the bush type tomatoes. And because they're coming in, they want to hit a certain window in the market. And so they're doing probably about three or four pickings through the crop in that one to two week period. The only thing is uh, they will grow somewhere between three to five feet, usually depending upon the variety, and that you can use a cage but you don't have to have this, uh, the staking that's necessary in the indeterminate. Uh, so they're also perfectly suited for the container planting, which makes it nice. And here's just some of the varieties that are used <clears throat> that are determinate. <clears throat> the ace, the bush beef steak, the bush early. <clears throat> and now there's a regular beef steak and a regular early girl which are the indeterminate ones. They're the, they're the ones that are growing up your steak and so forth. <clears throat> and, and Italian Roma. I got something in my throat there. So the indeterminate, of course, are the ones that keep on growing throughout the, up to the frost time. And so you need some kind of a support system, whether it's a steak or string or whatever it is. And you keep on growing. And here's a key factor. And one of the things for disease control and is to take out the lower, take off some of the lower uh, leaves of that plant because a lot of the fungus or fungi, they, uh, they live down in the base of the tree or the, the plant itself, I'm sorry. 
And here's some of your popular varieties, the beef steak, big boy, brandy wine, uh, some gold, and there's a bunch of others. <clears throat> we'll talk a little bit about varieties, but we just don't have all the time to talk about a lot of varieties today. So that's, that's actually another talk. Then we get into the actual diseases, disease problems. Uh, we have the non-living and the living type. That's the abiotic and the biotic diseases in the plant pathology terms. So your non-living, of course, are all your environmental issues that you're dealing with. The stresses of uh, temperature, light, water, nutrient stress. And of course, the, uh, the herbicides <clears throat> or wildlife, that type. <clears throat> Biotic diseases are your living organisms. Those are all your, your, the fungus, the bacteria, the phytoplasma the nematode and all the other viruses and different types of organisms that will infect the plants, plus all the insects and mites. So what we're gonna do today, we're gonna look at, at doing a, a cascading of the, what do we call that? The, um, and I don't see that on here. <clears throat> Yeah, what we're gonna do when you take a look at your button in the chat button, that's what I was looking for. In the chat button or the chat, you could put down an answer. This is kind of like a practice because we're gonna have all the 25 samples up there and you're gonna, you're gonna take your guess of what it is or you might know them. So the important question here, this is like a trial now, this little practice. Where did tomatoes, tomatoes originate from? So go to your chat box, type it in there, the country or area or continent, and type it in there. I'll give you a few, few seconds to do that. That's what I was looking for. And then when I tell you, I'm gonna go three, two, one, and then everybody push their, their uh, chat button at that point. Can everybody, does everybody understand that? So if you want to be more interactive and participate, it's, it's kind of neat when everybody puts their questions or their answers out there to the question. Okay, you ready? Give me a little bit of time. Three, two, one. Everybody hit that button. Looking for that chat box. There we go. There we go. There's lots of answers. <clears throat> South America, definitely. South America? Definitely. Is that correct? So here's what we got. That's Specifically Peru, maybe. Thanks, Chet. <laughs> Peru is, is definitely it. Oops. Really? Awesome. Yeah. Here we go, Chet. Peru is where they originated from, usually around the Andes. So it's Peru and Bolivia and all those countries up along that western part. And uh they didn't <clears throat> originate here in North Carolina or in the United States. They probably were up in Mexico and made their way over. So you say, uh, why is that so important? Well, it's important because think about where they originated from. It's more subtropical and it's a plant that won't tolerate a lot of, a lot of cold temperatures. Uh, in some of these areas, you probably have sufficient amount of uh, moisture and everything. So <clears throat> that's one of the reasons. So South America or Peru is the, the correct answer on that one. So I'm going to give you your first sample. What if you came up to a tomato plant in April or May? <clears throat> so you're out in your backyard and it was looking great the other day, but then suddenly the blossoms started dropping. So what caused it? What do you think actually caused the drop of those blossoms? Are we chat testing again? Yes, put it into your chat. Then I'll say, I'll say the three, two, one eventually here. Okay. Three, two, one, everybody hit that button. Cold temperatures, heat, cold. <laughs> it's 
So definitely it's weather related. <clears throat> you got the blossom drops that, that occur. Temperatures that are too high, usually above 85. And sometimes we'll, we'll have that in the spring uh, during bloom. Uh, definitely you'll have that below 55. And a lot of people that put their plants in early, they have problems because the temperatures go below that 55 and sometimes their buds are falling off. But there's other areas too, the lack of pollination, humidity that's too high, and sometimes a lack of water, as somebody said there too. <clears throat> so here's your second one. I'm starting out with some easy ones, and then we'll get into some harder ones. So this is, you go back into your, uh, your neighbor's tomato planting in the garden, and you see all these leaves coupling and they're asking you why are my leaves coupling like that what do you think caused that so write that in your chat we'll take a few seconds to let you do that Okay, three, two, one, everybody press that button. And you've got everything from needs water, heat, definitely heat, needs water, definitely drought, water stress. Water stress is definitely, and it's definitely a physiological problem. Lack of water, aphids. <clears throat> Probably in this situation, it wasn't aphids, but aphids do similar. This is actually a coupling of the leaves. <clears throat> That's why you'll know it's probably stress related uh, with the with the actual water stress. So that's where you get that curling or the coupling. It's either too dry and sometimes it's too wet. So when I say it's too wet, it might be a soggy area. Uh, it will sometimes do that coupling with the leaves also. <clears throat> okay, number three. Now keep track if you're getting these right or wrong too, because uh, I know Chris probably has his grand prize for you too, if you get them all. Right, Chris? <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> so here's number three. I guess what I'll, I'll ask for this is, what is this called? First of all, that's the big thing. And what causes it? So write that in your chat or type it into your chat box. Okay, three, two, one, everybody hit their button there. So scarring, cat facing, uneven moisture. Yes, that's it. Cat facing, cold, yipper, that's it. Bottom rot. Well, it's actually known as cat facing. And the disorder occurs when weather conditions interfere with the proper pollination and fruit development. So <clears throat> usually during the cooler time periods, it's usually that below 50 degree Fahrenheit, which will cause some of that to happen. And you won't see all of the tomatoes do that, but you'll see throughout the plant, you'll see some. So cat facing is what it is caused by a weather related issues. <clears throat> if you're, I'm getting to what I was talking about in the beginning. So temperature has a lot to do with it. And because this is a plant that is grown out of its native cl climate. Now here's one, I'm sure many people have seen this one. You find it on your fruit and it is, you got this little black, and sometimes it turns yellow first, right at the tips of that bottom part of the um, tomato. So what do you think causes this? So you can put that down. Okay, three, two, one, 
Put them out there. Oops. Blossom and rot. Yeah, Chris, you went too fast. <laughs> unavailability of calcium. Yes. So why was there unavailable amount of calcium there? And the next or the next one that Chet put said yes, water stress. So water stress, which takes the water takes it up into the plant, takes the calcium up into the plant. So if it's stressed, it will get this. And they call it the blossom end rot, of course, caused by insufficient calcium. But it's not only a nutrient issue, it's also a water issue. Uh, here again, you got to have the moisture. So some of you are doing pretty good there. Chris, you better have a good prize. Okay, here's sample number five. You go to your neighbors and you start looking at their tomatoes. And you start, start seeing all the twisting and turning of leaves, a little strappiness of the leaves. But you notice on the tomatoes, and then sometimes you're looking around, you see it somewhere else on maybe the peppers or some of the other plants. What do you think that caused that issue? It's not just on one individual plant. It's on a number of plants and plant species. Okay. Three, two, one, hit the chat button. Yes, herbicide. Aphids, probably not on this situation, but aphids can curl the leaves. There's no doubt about that. And you gotta see that, that sign there. But herbicides is definitely, definitely the damage in that particular one. And especially if it hits a number of different plants. Now here's a good one that some people will see this one. <clears throat> it's on your plant, usually found on the, and, and you gotta pay attention to where these tomatoes are found on the plant. It's usually found in the top parts or parts that are really accessible to uh, a lot of light. And what do you think this is called? And what is it cause? What caused? Okay, your chat button. Three, two, one, go. Yes, sunburn, sun scald. Sun scald, sun scald. Yep, you got it. This is caused by the sun beaten down and that can come up here in June. You start seeing a lot more of that June and later into the season. <clears throat> Usually found on tomatoes or peppers. And it causes that little pale white yellowish blotches as you see here on, on your tomatoes. So all environmentally related with the sun. Okay, another one here. You're going to your neighbors and he comes to you with, hey, I've got these uh, formations in my tomato and cracking into my tomato. What causes that? Put it into your chat and then we'll press the button here in three, two, one, go ahead. <clears throat> Uneven moisture, too much rain. Yes, that is it, Ruth. It's the fruit cracking, which is caused by, now this could be a situation, we're in a dry period right now. So at the end, let's just say mid to uh, end of June, <clears throat> and it could be any time here in the next uh, few weeks, you have a real big downpour of rain, a few inches of rain. And <clears throat> what that does is all that water gets into the plant, pushes all that water up in there, and the cells can't grow fast enough. So you end up having a lot of cracks on your tomatoes. It'll happen on green tomatoes, and of course, it will ripen as it goes. You need to happen at the end of the season, too. So, how's everybody doing? Any questions so far? If you do have any questions, put them into the chat box. Uh, Chris or I will try to help out with any of those. So trying to give you some uh, basic ones because we're going to start getting into some, 
some harder ones here that are harder to identify. Here's, the, um, here's one of them. Leaves, stems, and fruit are affected. Okay, you go into your, uh, your friend's house and you see these plants. He's got a bunch of good ones there, but then there's a few that are really looking pretty bad. Browning of the leaves. You'll start seeing these little spots on the leaves with a little halo. And, you'll, and you actually, you might see some uh, these little dots on the fruit. So what causes this? What's the name of the, the organism that causes this? There's a question, is, does sun scald mean that tomatoes should have partial shade here in the South? Not necessarily. Um, in a lot of plantings, they might have a little portion of being shady in that, but yeah, that's it, Chris. They should have a leaf cover. If you've got a planting that's right out there and a lot of sun's coming down, they use cheesecloth and some other types of materials to really decrease the amount of sun that comes in there. Okay, we'll do a three, two, one, and push your chat button <clears throat> on what this is. Three, two, one, go ahead. I guess nobody knows what it is, huh? <laughs> okay, here we go. Whoops. Septoria leaf spot fungus. No, not necessarily, Kay. And Christine said spotted wilt virus. No. Anybody else want to give a stab at that? There's usually always one person online figuring it out. Early blight. No. This is what it is. It's bacterial spot. And in North Carolina, it is the Xanthomonas uh, perforans, which is the bacteria. Bacteria is a problem uh, with, with tomatoes. There's quite a few bacteria actually, and I'm gonna talk about some of those. So the, the Xanthomonas perforans is the one that will cause the problem. And it gets onto the leaf, causes that little circular and water soaked uh, on your leaf. And actually, will get also onto the fruit as I've showed you. And this is only controlled by good sanitation and, and watering methods. So you don't want to water overhead. Try to keep your water, you know, either in a soaking hose or something of that nature. Now there are copper-based compounds and copper base of course is on the organic list uh, that can be used. Now there are some fungicides that can be used on that too, but in the home, garden, I would use a lot of the more sanitation methods to keep the leaves from off the ground in relation to uh, uh, overwintering, that type of thing. So here's another one. You start seeing some of these little dots on the, on the uh, fruit as well as on these leaves. You'll start seeing these little type of lesions that are on there. And this is a tough one also. Let's see if anybody can figure this one out. Three, two, one, hit your button there. Yeah, nobody wants to give a chance on that one, huh? <laughs> Okay, it's bacterial spec, another bacteria. This one is Pseudomonas syringa. So there's some different types of bacteria that are causing some problems. And the key factor is to know pretty much how to identify a bacteria. It doesn't matter whether it's bacteria spot or speck. Spot is what you're gonna see most of in the North Carolina gardens and plantings. And again, this, this one does leaf, stem, and fruit. And you'll see that your best controls, of course, are the sanitation and watering methods and some of the copper-based uh, compounds. 
that's your best control on some of this. Here's another one. You go into the garden and you see this, these leaves down here in the bottom of the, the plant, but it's also in the top of the plant. It's, it's all over. Usually it's one or two plants. If it's in a garden type situation, it won't be all of them. And if you follow that down into the stem, you cut, you cut your stem off there because it's, you know, the, the plant's pretty well done, we'll say. And you can notice this browning that's occurring now. Now, if you cut this off, put in a glass of water, you can see the actual bacteria coming out of there. And then you know it's bacteria related. That's just an easy way of doing it. Okay, three, two, one. Oh, you're thinking stink bug damage. That's a good, that's a good guess. Anybody else have any uh, idea? It also gets in the fruit like this, little dots. And here's a severe one. No idea, okay? This is the bacterial canker. So I just gave you three of the main bacterias. Bacteria, the things to remember about bacteria is the bacterial spot is probably the one that you're going to see the most and will cause you the most problems. You'll see the spots on the, the fruit. Bacterial canker, you'll see that occasionally, but I just want you to let you know there's a number of bacteria that do cause some major issues with the leaf, stem, and fruit. This one's caused by the Clavobacter uh, michiganense. And it's not found as much, but you still can find it in some situations. And the thing with bacteria you gotta remember is the sanitation methods. Just trying to uh, make sure <clears throat> any of the leaves, if you find any of these types of leaves, if they're on the ground, pick them up. Now, they just get all over the place and, and then they spread that. Uh, it probably overwinters in the, uh, the plant material. So the best thing to do before the next year is to get some plants like that out of there. And then you can use some of the copper, copper based uh, compounds and that would take care of all the bacterial cankers in that as well as spot and spec. So three bacterias that um, cause some major issues with tomatoes. Now we'll switch some gears into, you're gonna walk into the garden and you start seeing your tomato, start getting this little spot on there. That's kind of gushy and uh, not too good. This is a pretty common, I'm gonna tell you it's a fungus because you can start, if you take a look down at the base, of the plant, you start seeing some mycelium down in there. This is all part of the fungus, so it is there. So which one do you think causes this? This is a pretty common one. If anybody has an idea, just put it in the chat box and see if they know it. You're saying southern stem blight? Nope, it's not southern stem blight. You're getting close. I say this is a pretty common one because it's found in raspberries, um, blackberries, a lot of the berries, strawberries, uh, and a lot of the uh, vegetables. And it is botrytis gray mold. Botrytis is a fungus that really is a, is a devastating one uh, for a lot of plants. And it gets on the leaf as well as the lesions. It's got that, that whitey soft rot and often uh, it ruptures the skin and everything. But if you see here, this down in this area, you'll see this whitish uh, mycelium down in here and then brownish around the, the base of the tree or the the uh, plant itself. 
Here again, botrytis is one of those, it's all cultural practices. I mean, there are fungicides that take care of it, but there's no sense in, in doing that. You, your cultural practices will, should help in, in any manner, but that's something that you might have. And if you do have it, so the next year, it's better to uh, rotate your site if you can, your garden if you can, or try to clean up your leaves as much as possible. Yeah, your when I say copper-based compounds, they usually make some like in Lowe's or any of the, the garden centers, they, they have what they, they have copper in them, in the fungicides. So uh, copper's an old, really old uh, fungicide that they knew about way back in the beginning of time. And uh, whenever they found copper and uh, they used it for taking care of uh, a lot of plant diseases and that. It takes care of a lot of fun, any kind of fungi. And, um, that type of thing. Home Depot had Southern Ag liquid copper fungicide. Good, good point. Hey, thanks, Chris. You're on the ball. <laughs> okay, here's one that's pretty common with anybody that's growing tomatoes or any plants from seed. It affects the tomato seeds planted in containers. Does anybody know what that, that particular disease is? If you can, just put it into the chat box and see how good some people are. Damping off, you got it. This is damping off of tomato seedlings. And of course, this is a result, it's another fungus and it's many of them. So it's Rhizoctonia, Pythium, Fusarium, it's all the different types, Phytophthora, uh, that cause problems for growing of any seeds. And it gets into the sanitation, making sure that your plastic uh, containers are clean and disinfected, as well as your soil. If, if not, you're gonna have some issues with these. Pretty common one to see. Now, this is one <clears throat> that if you go into your garden and you see a lot of leaf, stems, or fruit, it's dying from the bottom up, making its way up the plant. As you see here, it's not going to be every plant, but it, it could be a few of them. It also has these lesions, which are kind of like a, some of them look like a bullseye. These little spots with little halo. Anytime you see the yellow, it's just a, a fun, or the leaf walling off the fungus the best they can. But you also see some spots on, you'll see some spots on fruit too. And this is probably one of the most deadliest of the, uh, the fungus the fungi that are actually occurring. So does anybody know which one this is? It was said before already. If anybody knows it, put it up in the chat. Septoria, no, we're getting there though. <laughs> so keep that in mind. <laughs> it's early blight. It's called, uh, caused by the Altenaria. Um, fungus. So this is where you get these lesions, like I was telling you, almost like a uh, target. And it really will take out quite a few plants. This is one, they actually have a blight cast, they call it. It's a computer program that growers would use to put on the proper fungicides at specific times throughout the season. That's, that's the critical part. If you're gonna do any kind of control with fungicides, you gotta get it at the right time. And it has to deal with the temperatures and the amount of moisture that's out there. And they kind of know all the information on how to do that. But for a homeowner, you're gonna probably do these type of, of cultural controls. The trellis tomatoes, to increase the airflow, you want that airflow so they're not spreading more of the spores. You use a mulch to prevent spores from splashing up onto the plants, that's critical. 
And then remember I was talking about taking off some of the bottom leaves as the plants grow. You can do that in the uh, your tomato varieties that are staked there. You take off some of the, the bottom leaves and not a bunch of them, but I'm just taking like the first few, um, first few there because they're the ones that will get the spores that will come up as it rains and the drops will come up onto those leaves and with the fungus itself. And a big one, of course, is rotating your garden. If, if you're in a site that has this really bad, your best is if you, if you have another area to, to go to, that's your best idea to do that. Sometimes a lot of homeowners can't do that and it makes it difficult for them. <clears throat> There's all kinds of fungicides on the commercial level that, that take care of that, but they have some also uh, for the homeowners. There's some vegetable uh, space for early blight. Here's, a, here's another one that's pretty bad with tomatoes. As you'll see, your leaves here with this grayish brown lesions that are on the leaves, on top and underneath. And then you'll start seeing fruit with these kind of big spots, big areas that are actually uh, just make it really bad. And it's, it's a serious problem with tomatoes. Does anybody know what this one is? You put it in your chat book, chat box if you do. <clears throat> so we talked about early blight. What's the other one? What's the opposite of early? Late blight. Another bad one caused by the phytophthora fungus. And it is the one that caused the major issue over in the Irish potato famine back in the 1840s, if you ever read anything about that. And that's why we had an influx of Irish immigrants coming back into the United States at that time period, because all the potatoes practically died. So it, is, it can be a very devastating disease. And it, it can be for even in the home, the home garden. They do have resistant varieties for them now. And there are some copper, or there is a product called chlorothalonil, daconil, as, as, and sometimes that's in some of the fungicides, the vegetable fungicides that are used. But here again, sanitation and rotation of the garden are probably two of the big ones. And it, you try to do the best you can. If you've got it in the garden, your best bet is to make sure that garden is clean up the best they can so they don't overwinter in those leaves. Okay, here's number 15. We're gonna change organisms now. You come up, come up here, we get some fruit that's all kind of like mottled, as well as the leaves. You got this uh, yellowish modeling that happens in the leaves all over the plant. Does anybody know what would cause something like that? It's tomato, tomato mosaic virus. Now tomatoes get a lot of viruses. Most of them will come in on either seed or plant, but there are ones that are, that are passed along by aphids, white flies. You'll see this in the greenhouse growing of tomatoes. So if any of you have greenhouses, small greenhouses that you're growing some tomatoes, you might see some, some viruses in it. And this is one of the main ones that you'll see. And it's really causes that yellow uh, mosaic type symptom on the fruit. So there's a, there's a lot of viruses. I'm not gonna talk a lot about them, mainly because there are, you're not gonna see too many of them, hopefully, but this is one that's very possible. Here's the next one. And somebody said this a number of times ago. This is on the leaf. 
and it's only on the leaf and stem, okay? One thing that gives it away, these little spots are really, there's a lot of them all over the, the leaves. And this could be at all stages of the plant. Does anybody know what this one is? Obviously it's a leaf spot, but what's the name of it? Somebody just said it before. Spotted wilt virus, you say? Nope, not spotted, spotted wilt virus. It is actually septoria leaf spot, as somebody said before. This is the one, it's pretty easy to identify, as I was saying. It's mostly on the petioles and it's on the leaves, as you see here. And of course, it's called septoria. Septoria because of its name, Septoria like a persica. And the control again, use raised beds and rotate the beds if at all possible. You want to mulch the garden to prevent the water splash. And so they talk about a lot of mulching. So some people use the black plastic, some people use other types of mulch. Um, but you want to remove the affected plants if you ever see this, just to reduce the amount of disease there. Here again, there are some fungicides, the copper, uh, the chlorothalonil, which is the daconil, or the mancozeb. Okay, number 17, we're gonna get to one, this was mentioned too, I think, before. This is a, you come across these plants that are in a row, and one or two of them are wilting. Now, if you go down, of course you see the leaves wilting, the whole plant is wilting. It's usually later in the season you'll see this. But then if you go down by the actual uh, plant down by the base of it, you cut it and then cut it open, you'll see this dark um, cell growth there. It's going into the uh, plant. Does anybody have any idea of that particular one? Here it is out in a field, which you will only see it by a number of plants. There won't be all the plants throughout the planting. It'll be just a, a number of plants. That's why in a home garden, it'll only be one or two plants usually, if you see it. And that's one, it's called the sac Southern Bacterial Wilt. Now, if you remember, if you remember about, if you cut down the base, you, every time that you see this discoloration in the stem, you know you've got bacteria. You cut that off, put it into a glass of water, that clear glass of water, and if you hold it up to the light, you could see the actual bacteria coming out. You'll see the stream of bacteria coming out of it. That's one way to know you're dealing with a bacterium. And this one, of course, is a soroborn born one, Ralstonia. And it can get into uh, all kinds of plants from tomato, tobacco, potato, eggplant, pepper, and mostly all the solanace solanaceous plants. Here again, cultural methods, sanitation, crop rotation are the big ones. Uh, they even use bacterial resistant rootstocks, believe it or not. They must graft the variety onto it. So that's kind of interesting. I've never seen that before, but it's, it's a practice that they do use. Here's one where you come into uh, your garden and you start seeing all these plants dying. And now the thing is, What's hard is that you know some of the diseases that we just went over. I mean, is that early blight? Is it late blight? Is it one of the bacteria? And what I'm trying to do is, say, is show you that some of these look very similar in the way they kill the plant and where they start. This one really wilts the entire plant, but you also take a look at what's going on down here at the stem. 
And I think this is the one that you said, Chris, was Southern blight caused by the fungus Alphalia. Alf and it's found on tomato and peppers, usually on the lower stem at the soils, as I was saying here. You'll see this little my white mycelium down here. Now it'll be different than the bacteria. The bacteria cut this open, you'll see the uh, differences in the color in that. But here you got a, a stem that you'll have a lot of mycelium around. And we talked about another fungus before about that. And you see a lot of cultural practices, sanitation, crop rotation, a lot of it's pretty similar. And for a lot of these, especially when they're um, soil borne, if you've got a soil borne problem, uh, you've got some issues in that soil. Your best is to, if you can, is to switch uh, your planting wherever it is. If you get some of these soil borne fungus in that, that's the biggest issue. And try to clean up as many of the plants. You know, a lot of people just keep their plants in the garden. It's a time factor and everything. But the only way to get rid of some of these diseases is to get all the plant material out of there as best you can. <clears throat> and clean up the leaves. Okay, talking about some other types of pests that get in there. Here's one that chews on the old tomatoes. Mostly hits the tomatoes, will hit also the, uh, the leaves in that. Does anybody know what this is? One of the, the worst of the insects. Corn earworm. It's uh, the tomato fruit worm, which is, yes, in that whole family of the corn earworms. <clears throat> and loves the leaves and the fruit. Uh, control, just like they do in corn, they use the BTs, the Bacillus thuringiensis, bacteria that actually kills it. They also can use some pyrethroids. So that's one if you have a serious problem with that. And that's probably, it's one of the tougher ones, or it, it is one that you, you would see is a tomato fruit worm. The other worm, this is a fairly common also. You know what this one is? Can anybody take a guess on that? The hornworm, yes. And you could tell that <clears throat> by its green, of course it's got its horns, but it's a, the green color, pretty thick. That's a big size caterpillar there. <clears throat> but you also see these little white, uh, what they are is they are the parasitic wasps that actually will kill that particular insect. So tomato hornworm is the uh, is what it is. And they will strip a tomato vine right down. I mean, they're pretty aggressive once they get going, usually in midsummer and throughout the remaining uh, growing season. One of the ways, of course, is picking the larvae off. Um, it, the parasitic wasps will do a certain amount of damage to them, but they're not gonna get them all. <clears throat> and there, there are some insecticides that you can play, you can uh, spray on there and, uh, and oils and that. Here's another one. <coughs> this is pretty common, mostly in, as you see what it does, it, it cuts, cuts stems off as well as it comes down to the very base. So you know which one that one is. The cutworm, yes it is, you guys got it. It's tomato cutworms, there's three different types, the black, the granulate, and the variegated cutworms. <clears throat> they all basically do the same damage to it. Really bad with vegetable seedlings, newly set plants, and uh, they, they hide in the soil, of course. And the pyrethroids, of course, are being used on them. <clears throat> it's 
So here's one more. <clears throat> this is another worm that gets in there. What it does is it will get onto a leaf and almost looks like a leaf miner, but it's not. But it chews out sections of the leaf. Any idea on that one? <clears throat> It's a tomato pinworm. Now, I didn't put the fruit there with a little hole. I didn't want to give it away too fast, but I should have. It's usually feeding on the leaves and stems mostly, but it also, when it gets done with the stems and the leaves, it'll make a little pin type hole and burrow right into it. And the BTs, the Bacillus thuringiensis, and the pyrethroids are being used mostly to control them if you have a serious problem. I'm not sure if any of you, if you've ever seen this one, I've seen this a number of times in some plantings, but they can be very damaging. Here's an insect that actually causes problems with a lot of plants. And not only in tomatoes, but many of the vegetables, it gets in the fruits. Uh, I found it in uh, peaches and nectarines. I've seen it on ornamentals. So this particular insect causes some major issues with tomatoes because what it does, it, here again, it eats and causes this little uh, white shaded area. They feed, surface feed on the tomatoes <clears throat> with their uh, piercing and sucking. Anybody know what those are? Anybody knows what they look like, they're little. You get, if you uh, take a leaf and turn it up around, you might see a, a little critter like this if you have a magnifying glass. But you can see those actually with the naked eye. Thrips, you got it. So this is the Western flower thrip. Feeds on flowers and foliage by inserting its modified left mandible into the tissue. And what they do is they suck the, the fluids out of the cells. And uh, this is done with horticultural oil, pyrethrins. Uh, it's not the greatest as far as chemical control because they get into the flower and they're hard to reach sometimes. But uh, there are some control methods there. And they will do a, a really good job on plants. I saw one in some uh, greenhouse growing tomatoes and they got in there between them and the white flies really did some plants in. Now here's one that you might see and you can see what it does. It burrows into the, in between the leaf cells and makes all these little configurations and you'll see it throughout the entire plant. You know what that one is? You can see that in a lot of different plants. It's, it's on a lot of different plants. This one's specific to tomatoes. It is a leaf miner. And <clears throat> it does, it causes that lightly colored, irregularly winding mines in the leaves. And here again, control is really just taking off the infested uh, tomato leaves. It's really, you can't do a lot. If you've got a serious problem with it, best thing to do is get that plant out of there because it's gonna cause problems for some of the other ones. Our last one, which everybody loves, are the wildlife. So you've got from the deer, to the squirrels, to the raccoons, to the groundhogs, to the birds, and many others. Uh, I've seen a groundhog take out a whole field, uh, not a whole field, but a, a semicircle around his little uh, hole and they will feed on the actual plants. Other ones will feed on specifically the tomatoes. <clears throat> but it's another issue that you gotta deal with. Uh, and deer will do the same thing. They actually will feed on the leaves, believe it or not. So that kind of gives you some of the major issues that you're going to see with tomatoes. All of those will be found at these websites, the tomato diseases, tomato insects, 
and also to production for growers and home gardeners. <clears throat> Everything you want to know about growing tomatoes in North Carolina can be found at these particular sites. The other thing too is if we can't identify some specific problem, we do use the plant disease and insect clinic, which are at these sites. You could send a sample down yourself. And <clears throat> if we can't identify it, they will uh, help us out. And they've got the actual tools to help plate out a bacterium or a fungus. And that's what's nice about that, because then I could, I could really zero in on what exactly did cause the problem. But generally speaking, you know that some of the major issues are things like uh, early blight and late blight, which are all fungi, and some of the bacteria that causes some. Of it. Okay, so yeah, the questions. Is it worth to try and keep seeds for next year? Uh, sure it is, you can. Um, and I've seen people do that very successfully. If you've got a lot of diseased plants in that, uh, such as, especially if they're virus related, then, then you, have, you have other issues there because uh, the viruses will carry over into the growing of the plants as well as the seeds. That's the only one that I would worry about. <clears throat> any other questions that anybody has? And if you do have any samples, I mean, bring them in. We'll, we'll try to help you identify them because you don't learn this overnight. A lot of these, these are your main tomato diseases that you're going to see. Now there's other things which are mentioned. What I, I didn't put aphids in there. Aphids are pretty common. <clears throat> White flies are fairly common, especially if you're growing them in the greenhouse. But um, there's a few like that, but most of the other organisms though, this is, you got some of your main ones right there. Any other questions at all? Uh, there's a question that there's um, organic control methods for early blight. Do you know of any? Uh, it's the, the organic, it's really the, <clears throat> with the early blight, your best thing is if you're using, if they're up on stakes and that, take the bottom leaves off. Mm -hmm. You're doing all, a lot of sanitation type practices, cultural type practices. So in other words, <clears throat> are you growing them on um, like a black plastic or a black landscape material or something like that? Uh, any kind of mulch you could put down there is helpful to keep those spores from jumping up onto the bottom leaves. And as far as organic fungicides, the only one that is, is possible and it might help out is some of the copper type. But that's a, you know, you don't have a lot of choices. Yeah. But if you've got serious problems with early blight, then <clears throat> in your garden now, and usually it's because of you're planting in that same spot for year after year after year. And some of these, some of these fungi get in there. And that's usually the one you'll see. <clears throat> if at all, that you can change your site uh, to get away from that particular one, that's the best thing to do. But not everybody has that kind of land to do that. Or take it out and do some container gardening for a few years. With tomatoes. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other questions? I just want to know where the nearest farmer's market is so I don't have to try to grow tomatoes anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you can find that out on the, on the NC, visit NC, NC, visit NC Farms. Yes. App. <laughs> <clears throat> well, yeah, you got the one, what, Elon has one, Mevin has one. Yep. Um, There's one at North in Burlington, yep, at North yep. Park. And uh, mm -hmm. so, yes, we have lots of farmers markets here with a lot of farmers who have solved the growing of tomato problems 
and they'll have some beautiful tomatoes for you, just in case this might have been a little bit too much information for you. Don't give up. It's always worth a try to get that homegrown tomato. Yeah. So now you, you take a look at all those that I presented there. And that's only that's only a portion of the problems that tomatoes have. I've tried to give you the, the top 25. <clears throat> and you see what Chris and I, we go through this all the time, trying to figure out and, and diagnose some of these, these uh, problems. And yeah. I know we're doing it with it on a daily basis, but- so one, some... one of the things that was mentioned earlier by one of the participants that I, you didn't touch on, you may not be familiar with stink bug injury on tomatoes. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, because they, uh, uh, they they're the ones that will sting the tomato and they will leave white hard spots inside the tomato. Yep. <clears throat> Disappointing, and that is from stink bugs. So, yeah, stink bugs are pretty, you know, the last few years they were taken off and causing some issues there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point, Chris. So, well, that's, so that's 26. Thing. Yeah, 26. 26. <laughs> yes. out, of, out of 7, That's becoming That's becoming more of a problem as the populations of stink bugs become a problem. And who knows what the next one is? Oh, the, how to preserve seeds. Uh, well, with tomatoes, you have to wait till it's dead ripe and then you have to, I, I think you have to wash the seeds in the slurry. Um, I don't have the yeah. information off the top yeah. of my head, but I can look it up for you if you uh, give yeah, us we a call. Could, <laughs> we could do that, yep. So anyway, but uh, yeah, contact us at uh, Extension for any kind of help. Uh, you can visit us online or you yep. can uh, call us. <clears throat> Six five seven zero sixty seven forty, or uh, visit us at uh, elements.ces.ncsu.edu uh, to see all kinds of stuff. More upcoming classes too. So, any questions? Any more questions about tomatoes? All right. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Bill. It was a great sure. program. All right.